Hey everyone, Path here. Now in a recent video on my channel, I discussed how physicists go about solving the Schrodinger equation, as well as what it actually means to solve the Schrodinger equation. We saw that the Schrodinger equation deals with the quantity known as the wave function of any system that we happen to be studying. And solving the Schrodinger equation just means finding the wave function psi, where the wave function contains all the information we know about that system. You can check out that video if you haven't seen it already up here. But towards the end of the video, I did something that may have been slightly annoying. After showing you the method for finding the wave function for a particular system, a particular basic system, I just sort of said that the solution also needed to have a factor of square root of 2 over a in it without really justifying it. I just said that normalization was the reason for this factor. Where in this case the quantity a is referring to the width of the potential well that we happen to be considering. And in this video, I want to discuss what I mean by normalization and why it's so important when thinking about quantum mechanics. Of course, I want to try and do this without going into any advanced mathematics, and hopefully we'll look at it in a more intuitive way. Let's get into it. To understand normalization, we first need to recall that the wave function is directly related to the probability of getting any experimental result when we make a measurement on our system. For example, if our system is a single electron, which in these videos is my favorite system to talk about, then the wave function is directly related to the probability of us finding that electron in different regions of space, where the experiment that we conduct on this electron is to try and find its position, and the experimental results that we're talking about is essentially where we find the electron. To keep things simple, we will say that our electron can only move along this axis here, the x-axis. It cannot move up or down or in and out of the screen. And let's also say that our wave function for this electron looks something like this. Now specifically, the probability of finding our electron in different regions of space can be found when we square our wave function. Technically, when we take the square modulus of our wave function. So if our wave function looks like this, then when we square it, it looks like this. And then we can calculate the probability that we'll find our electron between these two x positions by finding the area under this wave function squared graph. What we mean by this is that it's highly likely we'll find the electron between, say, these two x positions because this area is big, but it's less likely that we'll find it between these two x positions because the area is slightly smaller. Now, of course, it's worth mentioning that these areas are just mathematical areas underneath a function. That function is psi squared, but they directly relate to the probability of us finding our electron in those given regions in real life. But here's the interesting question. What is the probability that we will find our electron somewhere along the x-axis? And how can we calculate that? What we're looking for then is the probability that we'll find our electron between negative infinity and positive infinity on the x-axis, somewhere along the x-axis. In other words, we want to calculate the entire area underneath our wave function squared curve, all the way from as far left as we can go, negative infinity, to as far right as we can go, positive infinity. And this is when normalization comes into the picture. We know that this electron exists. We know that it must exist along the x-axis. We've said that it has to, right? So we know that we must find it somewhere along the x-axis. It must be there. Therefore, the probability of us finding the electron somewhere along the x-axis between negative infinity and positive infinity is equal to 100%, or one if we want to write it that way. But then if the probability of us finding the electron is represented by the area underneath the graph, then the total area underneath our graph must be equal to one. So we found a new condition, and this condition sets some pretty hard limits on what our wave function can look like. For example, could we have a wave function that looks like this, a flat line? Well, when we square that wave function, we just get another flat line. And now what we're looking at is a wave function that represents an equal chance of finding our electron, say, in this region, as we have of finding it in this region. Assuming, of course, those two regions are equally wide. So any two regions with the same width as each other, we have an equal chance of finding the electron in either of these regions. Seems pretty reasonable on the surface, right? Would this function work, though, if we assume that it went on forever, from negative infinity to positive infinity? We have an equal chance of finding our electron anywhere in the entirety of the width of infinite space. Here's where we have a slight problem. That condition that we just found out, the total area underneath our graph must be equal to one, if we're looking at it all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity, cannot hold for this particular wave function or wave function squared. 
Because if this flat line goes on forever in both directions, to the left and to the right, then the area underneath that graph is going to have to be infinite, and infinity can't be equal to 1. Now the good thing is that this particular wave function and wave function squared are not physical. It's not a good description of anything in our real life universe. There are two ways that I can think of to make this a bit more physical. Either we say that the universe is actually finite, so it does have edges, whether that's at x is equal to negative 5 kazillion and positive 5 kazillion, or some other value. And at those points we say that the wave function drops to zero because our electron cannot be found outside our universe. But within our universe there's an equal probability of finding it anywhere, because apparently in this universe there's nothing else other than the electron. Or we could assume that the universe is infinite, and then there's something at some point that causes the wave function to fall off to zero. Some sort of barrier at both ends that our electron cannot penetrate, allowing us to make the area underneath our wave function squared graph equal to 1. Now just to clarify here, we're not saying that an electron cannot exist in an infinite universe. We're just saying that in an infinite universe we can't have an electron where it's equally likely to be found anywhere along the universe. We need something to cause the area underneath our wave function squared curve to be finite, so we can set that equal to 1 with normalization. I think it's about time I finally answer the question, what is normalization? So to do that, let's consider once again the scenario that we looked at in my Schrodinger equation video. We were considering a particle bound between two impenetrable walls, so it had to be found somewhere in between those two walls. We placed those two walls at x is equal to 0 and x is equal to a. And we saw that the wave functions had to look like sine curves. Specifically for the lowest possible energy value of our particle, the wave function had to look like this. And when we square that wave function, then it looks like this, which means that we can find the total area underneath our wave function squared curve. It's finite. What this tells us is that if we want to find the total area underneath our wave function squared curve, we just need to consider the region between x is equal to 0 and x is equal to a, because our particle cannot be found anywhere outside of these walls. The probability of finding our particle between x is equal to 0 and x is equal to a, then, is equal to 100%, or 1. Now to actually mathematically calculate the area underneath a curve, say a sine curve, we need to use integration. And we can actually try and do that for the wave function squared curve that we've got drawn in here. If the wave function looks like this, then the wave function squared looks like this, and then we can integrate that between x is equal to 0 and x is equal to a. If you're familiar with integration, please feel free to pause the video here and actually check that this is what we get. We see then that the result we get here is not equal to 1. The area underneath our curve is not equal to 1. So how do we make it equal to 1? The answer is simple. We just stretch or shrink our function as necessary. And the way to stretch or shrink our wave function is by multiplying it by a certain factor. As it turns out, if we multiply the wave function by a factor of square root of 2 over a, then the wave function squared is multiplied by a factor of 2 over a, and therefore the area underneath the wave function squared curve is now going to be equal to 1. And you can also check that this corrected wave function, this stretched wave function, is indeed a solution to the Schrodinger equation. Whereas the original one that we had, just the sine curve, didn't technically work, because it didn't give us the right probabilities when we squared it. And so normalization is this stretching or shrinking process used to make sure that the probability of finding our particle somewhere along our x-axis, in this case, has to be equal to 1. We have to find it somewhere, because we know it exists. And what we've got here is known as the normalized wave function. This is the full correct solution. And that's all I've got for you today. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content, hit the bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of you that are supporting me on Patreon. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to all of you that watch my videos, like them, support me on here, leave some nice comments. Thank you so much, it really means a lot to me. Anyway, with all of that being said, I will see you very soon.